allow me to introduce Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. As the principal economic advisor to the government of India, he has made immense contributions in highlighting India's position as an international investment destination. Mr. Sanyal has previously worked as the global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank and has spent the last decade analyzing the rapidly growing economies of Asia. He has also served as co-chair of the G20, an intergovernmental forum gathering the world's 20 largest economies in order to address issues related to the global economy. And in addition to all of this, Mr. Sanyal is the author of best-selling books, including The Indian Renaissance and The Ocean of Churn. In 2010, he was named the Young Global Leader by the World Economics Forum. Today, we are privileged to host Mr. Sanyal to speak about economic policy making in uncertain times. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here on uh, this platform, uh, the uh, Warwick Economic Summit. And uh, we had originally planned to do this uh, in person, but we have to do it online, which is a good, sci a good uh, sort of uh, example of uh, the uh, issue that I'm going to talk about shortly, which is about how to make policies in very uncertain times. So as many of you will be aware, I am the principal economic advisor to the government of India. And like virtually every country in the world, we went through two years of very difficult policy uh, period for policy making. Uh, not surprisingly, because of what happened because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, in virtually every country in the world, it threw up all kinds of new and difficult um, choices and just caused major disruptions in global uh, um, trade and global investment flows. And so you can imagine how policy making had to evolve during this period. So what I'm going to do is give you a flavor of how that these things impacted India, how we uh, sort of made policy during these difficult times. Uh, and uh, hopefully you will get a flavor of how real-time policy is made under these circumstances, um, uh, it, it, uh, maybe in other countries as well, but certainly was done in India. Now I'm going to share a um, presentation so that you get a flavor of uh, what is going on. Uh, so if you give me a second, I shall share that with you. Uh, window. Share. Here we go. Okay, so this is a summary of uh, the economic survey for 21-22. We have a financial year in India. So um, that financial year runs from the 1st of April to the 31st of uh, March. And this is the economic survey for this current financial year that is coming to an end. Uh, and just before the presentation of the budget last week, um, uh, I, as principal economic advisor, presented the uh, uh, the economic survey, which is a survey of what has happened in the last year or two, uh, and more generally of economic policies. So um, this is an abridged version of that formal presentation. So what happened during the economic pandemic? If you look at the slides on the left, these are the real GDP and GVA, that's gross value added, whichever one you prefer, it doesn't matter. Just look at the GDP numbers if you prefer. These are the absolute numbers. Um, lakh crores is uh, Indian, uh, think, think of it as rupees trillion. Um, that is the best way to think about it. And you can see that these are, uh, this is real terms, so it's in uh, um, constant prices. And you can see the number for um, 1819 to 1920 obviously went up. There was GDP growth, so it went up significantly. And then in the year 2021, it came down because the economy shrank 3%. It went up again, which is this financial year. It, the economy grew by 9.2%. So what happens as a result of that? So if, you, if you're looking at it in GDP terms uh, instead of GVA, uh, then you can see that you'll take the blue bars and you'll use the yellow dotted line for the pre-pandemic level. And you can see uh, that in this financial year, we estimate that the economy is now just about a little short, about, around about 
um, short of, um, uh, sorry, 2% above where it was in the pre-pandemic period. In other words, the economy has recovered back to pre-pandemic levels. Now, that didn't happen in a straight line. <clears throat> so in order to understand that, look at the slide on the right. Uh, this is eBay bills. These are bills generated for payment of um, goods movement and GST payment. So this is basically a, a good measure of um, uh, the uh, movement of goods and purchases uh, inside the economy. And so you can see both volume and value. You can see that in the year, in April 2020, we had a major national lockdown. So big slowdown happening uh, naturally because you shut down the economy if you have a full lockdown for the whole country for a couple, a couple of months and the economy really shrank. Then things were opened up and the economy came back quite strongly. In fact, and if you can see in the second half of 2020, there's a sharp revival in the economy and it looked like, well, you know, <clears throat> things were looking like, you know, India had dodged the very worst of the pandemic shock. But after that, sadly, you had something called, a, the, the, we had a second wave of the uh, pandemic coming through in uh, April, May and June of 2021. And you can see there is a another dip there. Interestingly, in this second wave, even though the health impact of that was much more severe, uh, we did not do a full lockdown. We decided not to do a full lockdown. Um, and so you can see the economic impact of that is much, much smaller. Now, the obvious question people will ask, why did you do such a big major lockdown in, in, in 2020 when there were much fewer cases uh, and you didn't do a full national lockdown in the second wave when there were much more cases and many more deaths? And here comes the difficulty of making policy. You see, you have to remember how and when you're making policy, you don't know exactly how things are going to pan out. So you have to make policy in complete darkness about the future. So what do you do? Well, let's go back to March of 2020. What is the information that I had? The information that I had was something bad had happened in China and that, that it had spread to Italy and that it was killing a lot of people. Uh, beyond that, we had virtually no idea what COVID was doing. The information from the WHO was quite sketchy at best. So like many other governments, I'm sure that happened in the UK as well, we called in the experts. Now, the experts told us all kinds of things. Some experts said this is, you know, just a bad flu. You remember all of this, by the way, for conversations a year and a half ago or two years ago. And there were others who said, you know, this is the end of the world. There are going to millions of people dead. Now, as a policymaker, what do I do? I have such a wide range of outcomes possible, according to the experts, virologists, epidemi epidemiologists, and so on. So what do I do? Well, one approach which uh, some countries took, like Sweden, is that they took whichever was the forecast they thought was the most likely, and they went with it. So you basically, or Singapore did that. Um, uh, UK initially wanted to go for herd immunity, so that is the option they took. Now, when you're dealing with relatively small countries, you can still take a risk like that because it means that somewhere down the line, if you're, if, if the bet you took on, on, on a particular view uh, turns out wrong, you can have a hope of changing direction. But in India, with 1.35 billion people, I know that once I have taken a particular direction, I'm stuck with it. It's very difficult to change direction in a country the size of India with that population. So what do I do? Well. The way to deal with it is to something we call the barbell strategy. Those of you who will go on to study finance will learn about it. But basically, a barbell strategy is a combination of two opposite strategies to deal with an uncertain situation. So in the barbell strategy, what you do is one side of the barbell is that you hedge for the most extreme outcome. It's not because you think the most extreme outcome will happen, but you simply hedge for it. And on the other side, you make your way forward by in a flexible way through a Bayesian, Bayesian updating of information. So what were we doing in the first lockdown? Basically what we were doing, we were hedging for the very worst outcome, the likelihood that maybe the pessimists in the epidemics experts were right. So the best thing to do was to simply shut everything down, find out more information, put together testing systems, which we didn't have at that time, find out, you know, create quarantining systems, find out how this disease spreads. So 
when we were doing a full lockdown in April of 2020, that's basically what we were doing. We were doing a full hedging and hedging for the very worst possible outcome while we were making finding out more information. Whereas in the second wave, even though the Delta um, variant was much more dangerous, we knew that. But on the other hand, we were had a lot more information in April of 2021 than we had in the beginning. So although we knew the Delta was more dangerous than the first variant, we at least had a chance. We knew that it spread uh, through the air. We knew that it caused um, you know, breathing problems. Uh, by this point, we had some form of testing available, quarantining available. So we had a much better chance of dealing with it in the second wave, even though it was causing much bigger shock uh, in health terms. From a policy perspective, we had a much better chance of dealing with it. And therefore, we did not do a full lockdown. We did partial lockdowns in individual cities as the, um, uh, as the virus spread. But the impact, consequently, on the economy was actually more muted. And you can see, consequently, afterwards, the economy has since then recovered. The impact from Omicron has been even more muted. It's not there in the chart, but you can see that. You can see that. Again, let's see what happened to various uh, 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 sectors of the economy. And I've got here the latest estimate for the year 21, 22. And in the last column, I've got our current level of economic activity vis-a-vis -vis how it was in the pre-pandemic year of 1920. And you can see agriculture, for example, it wasn't affected. It doesn't really have too much of an impact. So it continued to grow. We are now 7.7% above where we were pre-pandemic. Industry went through a big shock. It shrank and then recovered quite sharply. So industry is a little bit above where it was, 4% above where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, in the case of services, however, we are slightly below where we were pre-pandemic. But that overall number hides the fact that there are big variation between different sectors. So finance or public administration and defense, these are not sectors that are affected so much by the pandemic. So they are actually above where, where we were before the, before the pandemic. But on the other hand, uh, sectors like, which are in contact intensive sectors, like the one, the category trade, hotels, transport, communications, stuff like that, you can see that's only 91.5% uh, of where we were pre-pandemic. In other words, we are still 8.5% below pre-pandemic. Not surprising, tourism and these kinds of sectors have not yet revived to their earlier levels. So, fair enough. What about macro stability? That's about growth. What about macro stability? Now here, this is something that we have to pay a lot of attention to because uh, if you're living in an uncertain world, it's not just about growth. You have to be careful that you know you don't get a massive shock which causes your system to you know uh, go into a spiral and so here again you look at the charts here of direct and indirect taxes and one of the interesting things that has happened interestingly we carried out a large number of tax reforms pre-pandemic in 17 18 19 and while of course during the pandemic year all kinds of revenues crashed um, what happens is interesting is as the economy revived during uh, the last one year, you didn't just see revenues revive back to where they were before pandemic. They actually went back to much above where they were before, before pandemic. And you can see that both with direct taxes, the yellow bar is the one that is what we have collected in the months I have data for, which is April to November. That's the first, um, nine, uh, it's the first eight months of the financial year. And you can see they're all well above not only last year's collections, but even well above what they were before uh, the pandemic hit us. And this has allowed us to do something interesting as far as reviving the economy. It has meant that we can use these resources and we can put it into capital expenditure, that is infrastructure related expenditure. And you can see that on the right hand chart, you can see that the amount of expenditure we are doing is well above what we had before COVID. And that's, this is a key reason why you've seen the economy revive. The budget presented just four days ago adds to this further, and we will we intend to dramatically ramp up um, infrastructure spending on highways, uh, airports, and other things. This is something this particular government has been uh, good at doing, and I will show you charts later. 
in uh, in terms of rolling out infrastructure this is something this gov this uh, cu the current government has been has a good track record so we can there's a likelihood that we will be able to do a good job of it going forward as well what happens to the to deficits as a result of this well you can see the fiscal deficits are are um much below where they were both the primary deficit and the fiscal deficit are below where they were last year as well as below below what they were before pandemic the financial sector is another sector that tends to be affected by uh, these shocks and you can see even before the pandemic there was a large increase in gross and net non performing assets of the banking system they, these were declining slowly before the pandemic but they have continued to decline interestingly after the pandemic as well this is critical because many people thought that our banking system would not be able to take the shock of the pandemic and you get this wave of non performing assets that's not happened and they've continued to decline the same thing is true for the capitalization of the banking system the bell, banks are well capitalized and there is no major issue bank credit growth of course slowed down very sharply during the pandemic it's slowly beginning to revive on the right as you can see but since banks are capitalized we can be confident should the private sector need capital they will get it meanwhile the stock markets have done phenomenally well and although the data is only available for the first 9 months of the year that's april to december you can see already uh, record amounts of money have been um, uh, have been galvanized through the uh, ipos in the financial markets and so that is what is happening but also interestingly there has been an explosion of startups now the map on the left is of india and you can see that the number of startups in india just 5 years ago was quite sparse and there were relatively few places where there were you know mumbai and delhi and bangalore and so on were, were hubs of startups but interestingly for whatever reason there seems to be a boom of startups in the last one year there's just simple explosion uh, this data that you have on the right hand chart is for the month months uh, it's up to 22nd of december so it's only for the first not even for the first 9 months of the year and you can see a dramatic increase in the number of startups all over the country so there are 555 districts of the country which have at least one startup and by startup i don't mean just any old company that's been set up these are so these are startups are certified by our industry department as having done something technologically interesting and you can see that there, there is obviously a hub around bangalore and there's one big hub near uh, mumbai pune but there's one uh, there's one near delhi there's one in, in, in you know there's just so many of them and all over the country so that's quite interesting this for whatever reason uh, pe young people seem to have suddenly got up and decided that they're going to go and uh, take risks uh, in the face of all this uncertainty now what about the external sector well and during the pandemic um, obviously there was a lot of uh, um, uh, uncertainty uh, and uh, both the current account, account and the capital account sort of flows fluctuate but despite that throughout the period the, the balance of payments remained well in surplus and as a result of which india now has one of the highest foreign exchange reserves in the world 634 billion dollars of foreign exchange reserves as uh, as of the end of december as far as inflation is concerned well um the 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 consumer price index we ha it has obviously been an issue around the world almost every country is seeing record inflation now in india we have a system of targeting inflation in a tolerance band of 2 to 6% and for a brief moment last year when things were the supply chains were disrupted it it had gone outside the tolerance band but right now the current inflation rate is running at 5.6 just about within the tolerance band of uh, what the monetary policy committee and the central bank the reserve bank of india targets um <clears throat> so in that sense it's within the band but of course given what's happening in the rest of the world we can't be um we will not be in fact uh, completely um uh, able to uh, avoid the problem of particularly high energy prices but also you know shortages of chips shortages of containers and so on and you can see that in the whole sale price index which has spiked up to double digits because of energy price uh, increases so all put together what do we expect india to do well here is my forecast of what india will do in the year 22 23 that's april 22 to march 23 we expect india's economy to grow by 8 to 8 and a half percent in real terms 
Now that might sound like a very high number, but do remember this is actually um, more conservative than what the IMF expects. The IMF expects India's economy to grow by 9%. But even with 8.5%, which is my forecast, um, uh, India would still be the fastest growing economy in the world. And let me also put it in the context that the uh, IMF's forecasts changes from between October 21 and January 22. They just published these on 25th of January. So these are absolutely the latest numbers from the IMF. And when they put the numbers out there in the three months, they had revised their forecast. You can see India's number had been revised up uh, uh, from to 8.5% to 9%. So they had upgraded our GDP growth forecast, one of the very few countries that did that for. And you can see almost every other country in the world has seen dramatic re decline, uh, reductions in their GDP uh, growth forecasts. You can see uh, the US, for example, has been reduced from 5.2 to 4, very dramatic. Germany from 4.6 to 3.8, and so on. Uh, the United Kingdom from 5 to 4.7. So you can see significant decline, uh, reductions in uh, GDP forecasts. Um, uh, but India, which was already the fastest growing economy in the world, sees actually sees an upgrade. Now, why is it that India has been successful in being able to deal with this shock? Typically, you think of uh, uh, relatively poor emerging markets having a lot more difficult time than, say, developed countries. But we managed to do this because of, again, I mentioned the Barbell strategy. Uh, and the basic idea of the Barbell strategy is rather than commit yourself right up front in an uncertain situation to a certain path, uh, what you do is you hedge for the worst outcomes and you make your way forward using Bayesian updating, i.e. basically adapting to the situation. So many other countries in the world, um, I will not name them because as a policymaker, it's uh, considered bad form to name other <laughs> countries, but you, you know which ones they are. Most other countries in the world basically came up with these dramatic, large reinflation packages uh, back in 2020. Um, and of course, you can imagine there was a lot of pressure on the Indian government to do the same because it's, you know, everybody said the economy is in bad shape. Uh, you need to go out there and do these dramatic uh, packages to reinflate the economy. Uh, we, however, took a very different view. First of all, our view was that the first impact of the COVID was not on demand, but on supply, i.e. you cause it. This is a supply shock. This is not a demand shock. Simply reinflating demand when you shut down malls and restaurants and so on is not going to help because the real problem is you shut down stuff. And so you first need to open things up before you invest in demand ramping up, which we did do later on with uh, infrastructure spending. But meanwhile, what you do is you respond uh, iteratively. So rather than come up with one big package, we came up with a lot of medium sized packages. Uh, and the idea basically is that as a result of that, we saw um, we had resources along the way to be able to respond uh, and use our, facility, uh, our, uh, uh, our resources in a much more targeted way than would have been otherwise the case. Now, many of you, those who are interested in, in things like, um, um, uh, uh, things like um, uh, software development will know that this sounds like the agile framework. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna flick a bit. There, are, However, we did do quite a lot of things to help the poor and we built literally uh, um, tens of millions of houses for the poor as part of something called the Prime Minister's Avas Yojana. And you can see some of those houses that were built during this period. We also uh, did something called a tap water mission, which we dramatically expanded across the country. Uh, ma many poor, uh, particularly rural areas in India, homes do not have tap water. They still rely on a well. And so that you can see between 2019 and January 2nd, 2022, dramatic expansion in the number of homes which have access to tap water. And we also did a lot of supply side measures. Again, I'm making this point. This is interesting because the primarily the primary the primary way in which most countries dealt with COVID uh, was uh, by essentially ramping up um, uh, uh, demand and managing demand. However, in India, we actually spent a lot of effort in deregulating and doing supply side reforms. Um, that used to be deregulated sectors like space and drones and geospatial mapping 
and we privatized Air India. And we also, of course, created a huge amount of physical infrastructure to be pushing out over there. Now, I'm going to show you to end some of the satellite and geospatial data to give you a sense of when you have a rapidly growing economy, what does it really look like? What does it mean? You know, you keep hearing about, you know, India's growing fast. What does it look like? So here is what it actually looks like in through use of satellite photos. Here is nighttime luminosity photograph of India in 2012. Okay, so this is a NASA photograph of India at night from 2012. So you can see where you can see Delhi, you can see Mumbai. There's all these places which have not, you know light space photograph showing um, what it looks like. So what does this same photograph look like uh, if, uh, taken from a satellite today? And this is what it looks like. You can see the nighttime luminosity dramatically going up. I'm going to go back and show you again. This is what it looked like in 2012. This is what it looks like now. So you can imagine the amount of electricity expansion of in, in, in various parts of the country that has happened in the last, just in the last uh, nine odd years. And I'm going to give you another, another example. This is what a highway network looked like in 2011. And it has been doubled in the last 10 years. This is what it looks like now. This is what it looks like in 2011. This is what it looks like in 2021. And this is before the ramping up that we are now going to do in our infrastructure spending. This is the number of airports operational in 2016. This is just five years ago. There are 60 airports across India that were operational. There are now 120. Five years, we have doubled the number of airports operational. Go back again. This is what it looks like today. Next. Um, this is also, uh, this I will skip because this is a little related to a more complicated issue of um, cropping cycles, which may be more complicated to explain right now. Let me come to this. This is Gurgaon, Gurgram, which is a city very close, just outside of Delhi. Some people used to think of it as a suburb, but it's actually a city in its own right. And this is a road there called Golf Course Road, which is now known as Golf Course Road. It didn't particularly have a name back in 2005. This is what Gurugram looked from a satellite uh, back in 2005. So six, 15 years ago, this is what it looked like. This is the same road, what it looks like today. Let me go back. Let me show you what it looks like today. And you can see the golf course on the top right-hand corner. That's where the road gets its name. It probably has a formal name. I don't know what it's called in reality. but And you can even see the uh, metro station and all those kinds of things also have come up. And of course, dramatic expansion. Now, let me show you something called the Bandra Kurla complex in Mumbai. This is today the financial hub of India. But back 20 years ago, this is what it looked like. It was basically empty. There was like, there was these, there was, yeah, this is basically what it looked like. This is what it looks like today. Let me go back and show you what it looked like earlier. And this is what it looks like today from the satellite. Now, I'm going to stop here because I'm sure there are lots of questions and pass it back to you. I can't hear you. You are silent. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal, for your insightful speech regarding policy formulation in uncertain times. On that note, I would like to move on to the Q&A session from our audience. A very popular question from the audience seems to be, how do you expect the educational losses caused by online learning and this general increase in dropouts to impact India's GDP in coming years? Okay, so um, there are two questions in there, and they're somewhat different. Now, India didn't quite see large amount of dropouts happening, at least out of the school system, uh, at least from the data that we have. However, that doesn't mean there's a, not a price that was paid. The price that was paid is, of course, that people didn't attend schools. Now, for two years, even if they did go back from time to time, it uh, got shut down again. So intermittently over the last two years, uh, all, you know, and almost a generation has grown up missing two years of school. That can't have been a good thing. And you can say what you want about online learning. There are other things that you do in school. You make friends and you have other, uh, other interactions. And frankly, even the testing systems online tend to be a little weak. Um, although, uh, you know, penetration of smartphones and so on have been uh, quite deep in India. Nevertheless, um, it's not so much laptops, but smartphones that have been used to teach people for the last two years. It can't have been 
uh, a great experience beyond a point. It's very difficult to tell what the exact impact is because it's difficult to measure. But my sense is that it there would be an impact and it would be significant, particularly in rural areas and so on, in the poorer sections of society. Uh, how do you bring that back? Well, first, first thing you need to do is to open the schools up again. And I'm hoping that now that vaccination has very widely been spread across India um, and um, we can now begin opening things up. Um, and so hopefully in the next uh, month or so, we'll be open, able to open our schools up uh, reasonably and keep them open. That's the, that's the first step we've got to take. And after that, we need to have a formulation of how we're going to call, allow for catching up. Now, again, uh, some attempt is being, being done top down in that a lot, uh, particularly in regional languages, a lot of programs are being going to create it for catching up learning. But frankly, um, I, my own view is that at some point in time, we may actually have to uh, drastically reduce uh, school holidays or something like that and catch up with it. I don't have an answer. But frankly, this will have to be done uh, at the state level. Because remember, primary education and secondary education are state subjects in India. And so really, this is something that will have to be done at the local level. Uh, it's not something that can be easily solved from a top-down perspective. There's a huge variation in development in different parts of the country. And the impact of these uh, uh, blockages and disruptions are different in different parts of the country. So I think a localized solution is what will be needed. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal, for clarifying this. Uh, I would now like to touch up on something that you did mention in your talk. You explained how the Barbell strategy helped India in the uncertain time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Would you say this was very circumstantial, or could it have worked in other economies similar to India, other emerging economies? My own sense is that in an uncertain situation, this is perhaps the only strategy any country can adopt. I'm making a very generic statement. This is not an emerging market thing. But even the most advanced developed countries should have used this strategy. Why? Because frankly, when you are dealing with a huge amount of uncertainty, there simply isn't any point in having grand plans. Because up front, you didn't know how it was going to go. So what you best thing you can do is hedge yourself from the worst possible outcome and then do a Bayesian updating of information and moving forward. It would have saved everybody a lot of resources, uh, reduced the amount of debts that countries had to take on. Um, and I think it would have been much neater for all parties. Secondly, I think that it would have been a good idea for uh, the world, um, uh, the, the policymakers around the world, to pay a lot more attention to the supply side. Uh, in that now, we, many of the problems the world economy is facing are not happening because of demand. Demand, if anything, has come back very strongly. The problem is happening all because of supply side, because there are chip shortages, there are shortages of energy, there are shortages of containers. So I think this, this idea that you could only have to look at the demand side and not bother with the supply side was fundamentally wrong. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal, for your answer. I'll move on to the next question from the audience. Do you believe that startup locations will stay centered in major cities or become more geographically spread in the context of India, of course? Yes, so that is why I showed you that that graph. That historically, of course, this startup culture was very much about a few cities. I mean, everybody knows of Bangalore and, and Mumbai and the area around Delhi, Gurgaon, and so on, where you know there are a lot of startups. And Indian startups are famous everywhere, so I don't want to tell you about that. But it was concentrated in these big cities. What has happened literally over the last year is that this has spread, and there's a is a major culture. If you go to Indian universities. Uh, even a few years ago, uh, you would have heard, you know, what what do what do young people want to do? And you would have a lot, lot of people wanted to join government service. That, that was a very popular thing that people wanted to do. They would want to take the civil service exam and become civil servants. Now, that has completely changed in the last few years with, you know, a dramatic increase in the number of people who want to go out there and set up their own business. And I think that is a very good sign. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal. Moving on to the next question, uh, due to the population size and land mass in India, to what extent is it harder to predict and make decisions in terms of the economic policies? Well, I mean, being large means that obviously 
uh, there are many more things that are happening than would be the case in a much smaller country. Uh, so it, India is indeed an extremely complicated uh, place. With as I said, it now is about to overtake China as the world's largest population. Even though our own population growth is also slowing dramatically, uh, but still it will go past China because China is now shrinking. Uh, so yes, it is a complicated place to make uh, policies for, and that is indeed even more necessary that we don't take take the sort of rigid approach to policy making, which we used to, by the way. India historically had a policy making strategy based on these five year plans and all these kind of socialist Soviet kind of thinking, which was extremely damaging. I mean, one of the reasons that India fell behind the rest of the world was because of these rigid approaches to policy making that we had for decades. We have now abandoned those five year plans and we take a much more fluid approach to policy making. And the proof of the pudding was simply in the last two years where I don't think too many people would have imagined that India would be one of the countries that would emerge from this crisis uh, with having the fastest growing uh, GDP growth in the world. You've talked about India's population growth. Do you see this as a deterrent to the economic growth or do you see this to sort of benefit it in terms of a growing labor market, for instance? So first of all, let me point out that um, India's birth rates have dramatically declined. We actually have birth rate of uh, the total fertility rate per woman is now down to two, which is below the 2.2 that is needed to stabilize the population. So it is not the case that India is, um, you know, has too many uh, yeah, births. Uh, the population growth now in India is almost entirely because we are living longer uh, and longevity is a good reason for, to have uh, population growth. Otherwise, our population is stabilizing. But of course, it's a large population. But it is going through one important demographic change, which is India till now was a very young country. A very large proportion of the population was below working age. And we are now entered the second stage of uh, demographic transition. And now from here on, uh, increasing number uh, or size of the population will become that of working age. The, the, the old age population is still going to remain small for some time. But for the next 25, 30 years odd, you will have a, uh, we will have a very low dependency ratio. I, a bulk of the population will be a working age, which is good for economic growth, incidentally. Uh, this is what was happening in China, for example, over the last 30 years. So we have entered that phase for the next 30 years. Um, as China ages, we will bypass them as having the world's largest labor force. Of course, the key in game in this is, of course, that we have to grow our economy really rapidly to create jobs for all these people. So that is basically the challenge. Thank you for clarifying this query of mine. Moving on to another question from the audience. How would India's government ensure that the fast growth is equitable in nature and is distributed to lower income households? So there are many ways of uh, thinking about this. Uh, very often what happens is we, we tend to get in, particularly in the West, debate gets tied up into conversations about inequality. But in fact, the better way, particularly in very poor countries, is to think about absolute poverty because you're dealing with people who are absolutely poor. It doesn't matter what the inequality is. The bulk of the population is just poor. And so you have to begin to intervene to simply lift them out of, um, of uh, absolute poverty. And that requires a slightly different approach than may be appropriate in other countries. But in India, what we are doing is we are, we are directly trying to help the poor by providing them services. And in, in, in a bunch of ways. First of all, um, we, as I, and I showed that earlier in, in the slides, we are putting in place the world's largest um, uh, housing program. Now, the way it's being done is quite different from, say, for example, social housing has been done in the UK, where sort of you go there and build um, uh, uh, some sort of a housing scheme, and then people move into that. Uh, our, our own experience with that, that it eventually led to poor quality outcomes and ghettos. So instead, what we have done is a much more demand-driven strategy where we essentially have a scheme where a poor person can come to us and he say that we want to build a house and we help them build a house wherever they want, in whatever style they want. So if you looked at the slides earlier, you would see the outcomes are very different. Different people are building different houses. All we are doing is providing them uh, a subsidy of various kinds, whether it's on uh, interest rate subsidy or other kinds of support. And, but they are building their own house. So you end up with all kinds of different houses. 
and outcomes, but this is basically what people want. And so that is one, one way in which we are doing it. Then there are other kinds of schemes. Uh, there's a major scheme that was done, which is in process right now, is to connect uh, uh, all houses with tap water. As I mentioned, a uh, large proportion, particularly in rural areas, uh, most houses didn't have tap water. They still uh, relied on the village well. And we are, we are putting in place that uh, infrastructure. And in just two, two and a half years, there are several states in India now that have 100% coverage of this. And so, you know, there are ways in which you do direct intervention. And the other way, uh, of course, inequality is not just social class-wise. You can also have geographical. Uh, so some part of the country becomes rich, another part becomes poor. So the other part is we are heavily investing in creating world-class infrastructure across the country. So Indian highways, till as recently as five, six years ago, uh, were very poor quality by, in, by, Indians, uh, by global standards. Um, but if you visit India today, there are many places where we have world-class highways. Um, in fact, some of our highways are better than those in the UK. Uh, I can even say that our, um, our um, airports are better than those in, than Heathrow. Delhi airport is by margin better than Heathrow. And we are building a new one in Jhevar, which will be even better than that. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanyal. And with that perceptive answer, I believe we have to conclude today's session. I would like to thank both Mr. Sanyal and the audience for this engaging session. Thank you. It was a pleasure.